This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, one, two. Hello, team. Welcome to Scream Something. My name is Rich, and I'm here with my co-host, Emily. Hi, everyone. In Scream Something, Rich and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions and general screaming for the first (laughs) few episodes of season three that were released last Friday. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, we promise, but we'll be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the mid-season finale. On the Engager, if Clamulons capture our crewmates, we move heaven and earth to find them. But this year alone, over 16,000 child and teen abductions have been reported worldwide due to the illegal trafficking of metahumans. Please, watch over your children. And if you see something, scream something. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. Hello, Megan. So this week, we are talking about the first three episodes of season three with the titles Princes All, Royal We, and Eminent Threat. They were released on January 4th, 2019. The in-episode dates first cover July 4th of Team Year 6 from the end of Season 2, and then we jump to July 4th to July 31st of Team Year 8. We'll break down exact dates when we do our full breakdown episodes. The directors for these three episodes were Christopher Berkeley, Mel Zwire, and Christopher Berkeley again in that order, and the writers were Greg Weissman, Andrew Robinson, and Brandon Vietti again in that order. <laughs> Uh, we were going to do special guest voice credits, but there's a lot of new characters. There's so, so many gonna, guys. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna couch those in the individual breakdown episodes. Um, everyone was fantastic, um, and we have some yes. uh, already have some interviews set up uh, for some of our new people. So we'll get to those as soon as we can. But until then, let's get on to our mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. So after a quick recap of the very end of season two. At the beginning of season three, we then cut to a hospital in Markovia two years later where a young girl is abducted and undergoes a procedure that turns her into a metahuman. Now transformed, she is deployed as a mind-controlled weapon on Ran where Black Lightning, fighting alongside other members of the Justice League, accidentally kills her. After the credits, we cut to the Watchtower several days later where we see the team, now with several new members and led by Miss Martian, (laughs) <laughs> An emergency meeting of the Justice League, now led by Calderon, commences there as well. <laughs> the AKA group- Aquaman. Yeah. Our boy Calder. He's all grown up. <laughs> so good. <laughs> the group discusses the ongoing metahuman trafficking problem that's been going on, but the meeting ends with six heroes, organized by Batman, resigning from the League, along with several members of the team we see a little bit later. And Black Lightning also resigns, but for personal reasons related to accidentally killing a child on an alien planet. We then cut over to Moscow, where Nightwing is investigating a metahuman trafficking lab based on intel from Oracle. Nightwing gets a sample of the tar being used to transform the metahumans before blowing up the lab. Oracle analyzes the sample and tells him that it's made from a clay that can only be found in the country of Markovia. We cut over to Markovia, where the king and queen hold a press conference about their abducted daughter, Princess Tara, and the metahuman trafficking epidemic. Meanwhile, their youngest son, Prince Brion, youngest by 16 minutes, learns that he has tested positive for the metagene and that his sister was probably abducted because she also had the metagenic potential. We then cut back to the U.S., where Nightwing is busy planning a mission with Oracle to take down the Markovian metatrafficking ring and recruiting former teammates and friends to help with the operation, starting with Artemis, who is currently living in Star City, with Roy Harper and her niece Leanne, 
and maybe Cheshire. We don't maybe know yet. Maybe Cheshire? <laughs> the, we'll the fact that I add maybe Cheshire to that statement every time I say it is... Maybe Cheshire? You kind of have to, maybe. right? And like, Bruce Lee. We know, we know Cheshire is around. She was in a trailer. We just don't know if she's here. <laughs> we'll see. I can hope. That's fair. <laughs> we then cut back to Markovia, where a metahuman assassin breaks into the palace and murders the king and queen, only to be killed during his escape by the queen's brother, Baron Frederick de Lamb. We shift from that brutal scene to Happy Harbor. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Where Nightwing arrives at Connor and McGann's house to recruit Superboy for his Markovia mission. Connor agrees, and after Nightwing leaves, he also proposes to McGann, who says yes while I scream into infinity forever. <laughs> We'll get to it. I promise. We were all living that moment with you, by the way. <laughs> a, a G. Gordon Godfrey broadcast reveals that Markovia is now under martial law, and until Prince Gregor comes of age next year, because he and his brother, Prince Brion, are only 17, Frederick de Lamb will be acting as king regent in the meantime. In Metropolis, Black Lightning tells his ex-wife that he's giving up the superhero life only to be stopped on the sidewalk by Nightwing, who tries to recruit him for the Markovia mission. He declines the offer, but Nightwing tells him the, where the team will be meeting later that night and at midnight in Centennial Park. Tigress and Superboy meet up with Nightwing, and Black Lightning does too, agreeing for one last mission. They hop aboard the supercycle, and we head off to Markovia as the episode ends. We then head to episode two, where it opens with uh, Garfield Logan, a.k.a. Beast Boy, doing a public service announcement about the abduction and trafficking of metahumans. Before we return to news footage of a UN summit discussing the metahuman trafficking problem and the resignation of several members of the Justice League. Meanwhile, in Markovia, Nightwing and Artemis go undercover at Prince Gregor's pre-coronation reception, while Superboy and Black Lightning fly the supercycle in under the radar to drop off the team's gear. At the party, Nightwing and Artemis scope out potential suspects, including both princes, Dr. Simon X, Dr. Helga Jace, and Baron Frederick de Lamb. While Prince Brion puts a plan in motion to try and find out how to activate his own metagene, Nightwing decides to follow the prince while Artemis gets their gear. Elsewhere in Markovberg, the capital of Markovia, apparently, <laughs> Superboy and Black Lightning investigate the local children's hospital and discover that it's acting as a front for the metahuman trafficking central known as Bedlam. There, they discover multiple unconscious children in pods, as well as a dismantled mother box. But before they can break the kids out, they are stopped by Count Vertigo and a metahuman referred to as Plasmus. Black Lightning can't bring himself to attack Plasmus because of his experience on Ran, but Superboy clears them an escape route and they attempt to run from the situation. In the Markovia National Cemetery, Artemis suits up for the mission only to discover a group of men burying several teenagers who died during metagene experimentation. Because we're not on Cartoon Network anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yep. Bye, Cartoon Network. <laughs> One of them, a teenage girl, uh, comes back to life and is rescued by Artemis. And we'll get into that later. Uh -huh. But together, they escape the henchmen and ride off on the supercycle. Meanwhile, Nightwing follows Prince Brion and Dr. X to the children's hospital. And underneath the hospital, Black Lightning escapes but is knocked unconscious, while Superboy is captured by Plasmus and dragged back to Bedlam. Then Nightwing arrives at the children's hospital while Artemis goes after Black Lightning. Inside the hospital, Dr. X shows Prince Brion the Metagene lab. Brion is disgusted, but before he can escape and tell his brother about the trafficking ring, Count Vertigo incapacitates him and has him thrown in another pod. Nightwing, Artemis, and Black Lightning all head out to converge on Bedlam to rescue Connor. But back in the lab, Dr. Jace arrives and begins the process to activate Prince Brion's metagene despite his protests. Yep. And then we go, go to episode three. So much happens in these three, first know. three episodes. I know. Episode three starts off with an interview between Courtney Whitmore and Garfield Logan, where we learn a bit more about his acting career and campaign to end meta trafficking before we cut to Prince Brion being encased in tar in the Bedlam lab. Outside, Artemis leaves the undead refugee girl with Supercycle before she and Lightning attempt to get back into Bedlam. 
Above ground, Nightwing sneaks in through the hospital and learns that Baron Frederick DeLam has been running the metahuman trafficking ring alongside Count Vertigo to gain power over both Markovia and Vladova and place both countries under the control of the light. However, Dr. Chase betrayed the Baron when she made Prince Brion meta-active against the Regent's wishes and is now working against the organization. Our heroes then arrive on the scene, now accompanied by the superpowered refugee that Artemis has dubbed Halo Girl, and <laughs> rescue Superboy along with the Doctor and Prince. However, they are unable to stop Count Vertigo and Dr. X escaping via boom tube with the metahuman teenagers they've been experimenting on. Nightwing successfully blows up the underground lab, but back at the castle, Baron DeLam falsely accuses Prince Brion of being a metahuman terrorist. Outside of Bedlam, Brion's metagene powers activate for the first time, causing him to manipulate geologic forces. Brion, briefly able to control them, but hearing the Baron accuse him of murdering his own parents, makes him emotional enough to destabilize his powers as he heads back to the castle to confront his uncle. Superboy follows after him, while the rest of the team remains on the beach to fight off Count Vertigo and his associates who have just arrived. And at the castle, a fight breaks out between Brion and Baron de Lamb, who is revealed to also be a metahuman. As the, res- as the rest of the team fights off Count Vertigo's team, we also find out that the metahuman trafficking ring has access to apocalyptin tech, and Halo Girl is seemingly burned to death by Plasmus. However, along with both flight and hard light shields, this new metahuman also seems to have healing abilities and comes back from the dead for the second time in these first three episodes. Back at the castle, Prince Gregor arrests Baron de Lamb after the fight, but also banishes Prince Brion from Markovia. And back on the beach, Black Lightning frees Plasmus from Bedlam's mind control, who then joins the fight against Dr. X. However, the young metahuman is then killed by a civilian attempting to help just as Vertigo and his henchmen escape via boom tube. And we are left with a lot of questions and very few answers. And Artemis saying, what, what do we, do, we do, now? do now? Yeah, And us exactly. sitting at home going, yeah, what do we do now? What do oh, we God. do now? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do this. I got some master. How about you? So do I. A lot happens. A lot Let's of do it. Let's do it. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Why don't you start, and I'll fold in. So so to start with the thing that I've been screaming about for the past five days, Superboy and Miss Martian are engaged, and I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> like, no one is surprised, but I'm very happy, guys. I heard that you screamed so loud things fell off your wall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a... T- I- <laughs> Behind me, where I'm recording right now, there's a giant bookshelf. On the top of that bookshelf, there's a there's like a little wooden plaque that's just balanced against some of my books. When Connor got down on one knee and proposed to Miss Martian, I screamed loud enough that that plaque fell off and plummeted to the ground. Uh, and I genuinely had to pause the episode and like recover for several minutes because I was happy crying enough that I was like, I, I can't pay attention to any plot. Give me a minute. The first time, the first time I watched the sh- watched the episode, the f- my first reaction was, "Oh no, they killed Emily." <laughs> <laughs> I had multiple people on Twitter tweet at me to ask if I was okay after the episode came out <laughs> about that specific thing. Not just in general, people were like, "So, uh, that thing with Connor and McGann, you okay?" I'm like, "I'm fine. I'm fine. This is fine." And like. Watching it for the first time, I genu- it was a building level of like shrieking at the top of my lungs because I was like, oh, they're living together. Don't assume anything. Don't assume anything. Don't get your hopes up. This could, this could mean many things. Who knows what this is? And then she's like- she I wasn't even the- sure they were dating until she yeah. said, I don't want to be that kind of girlfriend. Once she said, I don't want to be that kind of girlfriend, like I started to shriek and then Connor proposed and I screamed. <laughs> gotcha. They, they warmed you up there a little bit. Yeah. I was like- I told myself not to assume anything. I'm like, maybe it's like a team house. Like they're like a sorority now or something. Wow. I was like, I don't know. They don't have a cave. Maybe like all the team members who don't have a life live there. Nice. Um, one thing I want to mention though is uh, if you haven't read the tie-in comic that preceded this, I mean, we've talked about this a lot and I've talked about it a lot where I was like, I don't, I'm not sure if I want them to be back together, you know, because what McGann did was, was rough. Um, The tie in comic helps to bridge some of that for me. So I'm, I'm okay with this. 
I would like to see more. (laughs) Yes. I'd like to see more about that transition with their relationship. I agree. But but the tie-in comic is fantastic. And if we want more tie-in comics, and that answer is yes, we do want more tie-in comics, um, please go download and and read that from the DC Universe if you have access to it. If you don't, I don't know what's happening. I don't know. I'm sorry. Hopefully, it'll be available on Comixology. We have no... We have no news on any of that, and neither does Greg, awesome. and neither does Brandon, and neither does Phil, and neither does Christopher Jones. They just all have no, no answer. They have no, they have no control over any of that. So I've seen a lot of people badgering them with questions about, you know, uh, and they literally can't do anything about it. As soon as there's news, you will know it. <laughs> yeah, we'll let you know. But you know, aim your questions at the DC Universe crew and the people there. I mean, that that's the appropriate people to check in with and ask. But the tie-in comic, if you can get your hands on it, please read it. And um, yeah, it's it's real good. And like when we go into these episodes in depth in a in a while, I will have lots of things to say. But the short bullet points are one that ring is shaped like the Superman shield, and yep. I cry. Yep. Two, they communicate telepathically even when they're alone, and it's really cute, and I love it. And they transition between like speaking out loud and speaking it's very telepathically, Martian. and it's yep. adorable. And yep. I love it. And three, I think it's really important that that scene opens up with them genuinely having a conversation about like their emotions and expectations and having a conversation about like how they're both feeling and what they're stressed about because it's good and important and it matters. And yeah. I will promise to overanalyze it in a month. But like, yeah, it's a good it's a repu- it, it, it's a good representation of of I think a healthy relationship of discussion. I like that, too. Also, Wolf's there. I, know. I had a friend who was like, wait, did we see Wolf? I'm like, yes, Wolf is right there. He's fine. He's good. Yeah. All is well. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so other things that aren't Emily crying about Super Martian for forever. <laughs> Completely switching gears. I really like Nightwing's eye tech like thing that we don't have a name for yet. Oh, yeah. It, it's real good. They're I real cool. love that. That heads up display thing for all of them is amazing yes and i like and there's little things that they've done with it to make it really easy to figure out as a viewer without anyone having to tell you anything like everyone has little icons that are in the corner so you know who is Mm -hmm. speaking at any given moment when they're talking or and they everyone has a signature color so you know who's you are looking at whenever they cut to that view of the world like nightwings is light blue and artemis's is orange and I don't think we ever got we I think Superboy's is red, but I don't think we got much of seeing what his looks like. Mm-hmm. And so that's just great. I love that they're doing that little bit of visual storytelling and they, they have different things that light up on the side. So, you know, yep. if they're in infrared or whatnot. Yep. And also stuff at Oracle. the bottom, too. Yeah. And, and here's the thing that got me that I didn't notice until the second viewing. Only Nightwing has Oracle <laughs> in his heads up display. Yes. I caught it the second I must have blinked or something when they're when when Tigress and Nightwing are at the coronation and she says something like or maybe he just likes kids or something like that and yes. Oracle pops up in the heads up display and says I think this is our number one suspect Nightwing says I think you're right and then uh then Tigress is confused yes <laughs> and I think I looked away because I didn't see I, I don't remember seeing Oracle's uh text and so I must have like looked down at just at that moment because that was like, well, that was confusing. The second time I watched it through, I've been, and then now the third time I've watched it through, I'm looking very closely and Oracle's, Oracle's uh, icon does not show up in anyone else's heads up display except for Dick's. Yep. And I have to tell you, I'm fascinated by this. Same. Why they all know Barbara. Yes. Do they not know she's Oracle? Is she only working through the bat? team instead of the entire dc universe like in the comics i have questions i have a theory that it might be that everybody knows oracle exists uh, like everybody in the team and league knows oracle exists but because nightwing's kind of been like out on his own not really following any of the rules for the past two years nightwing might technically not be supposed to be working with oracle but is or something like that I I think maybe you're heading in the right direction, but I think this ties into something else that happens later because Black Lightning and Superboy put surveillance cameras all around that Bedlam facility that they're in. And they do a they take the time to do a quick shot from those cameras at 
Black Lightning, and Superboy. And their faces are spiraled out. Yes. That is technology from an organization called Spiral from the comics when Dick Grayson quit being Nightwing and became a secret agent. And yeah. I think it was a two-year run of Grayson. It was um, a brief run. But it was a brief yeah. run. But if he, he said, I needed a break, maybe he left being a, being Nightwing and a superhero, went to go be 007 for a while, and then brought that technology back. And maybe Oracle, I don't know, maybe some of that's tied into that. I don't know. Possibly. It's really interesting. And also, someone online uh, tweeted us, uh, and they pointed out that that Dick Grayson's suit, uh, his dark wear, is similar to Grayson's outfit design in the the Grayson run. We tagged Phil Barassa and Phil came in and said, no, that was just a happy accident. That was not intended. But I mean, there's only, I guess, so many combinations of that design type and color that they're going to end up looking very <laughs> like similar in some ways. Nightwing's colors are always black, dark gray, and sky <laughs> blue. blue. Yeah. There's only Sometimes a number some of red. combinations Depends. you can put in. Yeah. Yeah. So um, according to Phil, anyway, at this point, it's it, that was a happy accident. But it's a cool accident. But I love that quick nod. To, when that popped up, I was like, what? Whoa, that's got a thing. That's going to be a thing, I think. Or maybe it's just a nod to what he's been doing for the last two years. I don't know. Possibly. And I realized after like three watch throughs that that's why they have the face masks. That's what does that. Well, in w- it, so in the comic, it was actually an implant. Yes. So the face well, masks could be it. The implants also... I think in the comics, the implants did something hypnotically to people too. So it even, it, it affected te- technology, but it also affected people's memories people, of the people. Yeah. Uh, I don't, that Which doesn't, doesn't seem, seem to be the case because Superboy gets recognized. He does, but he only gets recognized after he takes the mask off. So maybe you're right. Yes. That's what I was thinking. I don't know. We'll see. These are all just crazy sp- these are all fan, just, these fan are all just freak out speculations. Yeah, yeah, for thoughts sure. Thoughts and suggestions. Also, if we're still on the heads up display, I do, I appreciate Oracle's use of emojis. Yeah. <laughs> via like, like for sure. attempted professional communication. And she includes an emoji at one point to laugh at Nightwing doing That's something right. stupid. I also, her and Nightwing are absolutely flirting. Uh, yes. We'll eventually get to that. Hopefully, fingers crossed. I would like to see hashtag more maneuver of that. seven. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to other cool things this episode because so much happens, especially in the first episode. There is so much. Yeah, but I know people are probably going to be wondering. I do like Miss Martian's new design. Mm. Uh, the two things that I have been dealing with over the like this weekend, the two main things people have been tweeting me about are asking me my thoughts on Miss Martian's hair and asking if I am alive after that proposal. <laughs> the answers are yes and yes. Nice. Um, cause I do like it. I think it's interesting. I think it's different. I shrieked when I saw it for the first time cause it's new and things are new and exciting, but I do think it's an interesting take on her character and like shows a lot of how she has matured as a character. I like that she found like this middle ground between yeah. human, like she did the thing that John did where he's like, I'm not going to have my normal form because it's too scary for humans. But I also don't want to lie about not being human yeah. when I'm in superhero form and how she's kind of owned her white Martianness in a way. And I, I really like that. I think it's a great step. Yeah, I really do too. I think it's, it's so interesting and just, I want to see more of that. I want, like, I know I'm trash and just want to see more of Miss Martian, but like, I like it. I want to see all of that. And I like, and it's a progression that makes sense to me. Yeah. Like it didn't yeah. feel like it came out of nowhere. I was like, yeah, no, I can absolutely agree with that. Also, she's leader now, which is real cool. That's uh, great. I wasn't expecting that at all. Like I, I thought it was going to be Barbara maybe or Oracle. Yeah. Maybe. I yeah. thought it might be Barbara, but now Barbara's Oracle and we don't know what she's doing out there in the DC universe. But I nope. think her being leader is really interesting and is such a, interesting progression from who she is in season one since miss martian has always been a character that thinks with her heart instead of her head a lot of the time and seeing her as leader i'm like oh that's fascinating please please show me more of this and it has me wondering if connor is kind of like taking over black canary's role in some way on the team because i feel like that'd be so cool i feel like i feel like i remember seeing uh like ask greg thing a while back that talked about how superboy kind of took over over time doing a lot of the like combat training for new recruits mm-hmm. on the team and like i just really like that idea yeah of connor and, like being in charge of that yeah and one of the notes that i had was um how bedlam is clearly 
better trained than Brion and just yes. takes him down. But then you immediately see Connor go up and instead of just throwing haymakers, he goes up and gets into a fighting stance and just hits him in the armpit and like hits him in the under his throat. And I was like, oh, this is everything. This is everything. Connor is, I mean, you have, you have Black Canaries training with Connor's super strength. Bye bye, buddy. See you later. Like, oh, it was so good. So good. It just made me think immediately back to schooled. It was so good. It makes me so happy. And speaking of Connor, jumping ahead for a minute, Connor being like the voice of reason when they have that scene on the beach and him like talking through to Brion and like talking him through how to keep oh, control yeah. of his powers and calm down. Focus on your Made breath. my heart so happy. <laughs> so good. The character like, growth seeing- is so good. Connor is such a good person and seeing him get to have that moment of like, oh, I can help people because I know what this is and yep. I know how to deal with it. I know and how you feel, that, buddy. Yeah. And showing that like Connor definitely like had stuff that he worked through over the past seven years of this show's continuity. It mm-hmm. makes me so happy. It's such a good, quick way of showing that character development and showing like showing us a little bit of what Connor has been up to for seven years that we didn't see all of. Mm hmm. I totally agree. Yes. <laughs> but going back to episode one, I I love Artemis living with Roy and Leon. And I know a lot of people, our, our wonderful sound producer, Neil included, had a moment of real confusion when they cut to that. And we're like, I was confused man? too at first. It was me too. It wasn't just Neil or everybody else. I was like, what? With a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, Until yes. he opened I his just, mouth. I just remember Neil, Neil uh, texting us and being like, has Artemis moved on? What happened? <laughs> like, right. No, no, that's Roy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I like I like that idea that she's been living with Roy and Leon, and that they have yeah weird little weird little family home of all of them together. Hopefully, Jade's there too. I want Jade to be yeah. there too. I want them to be a weird little dysfunctional family. <laughs> we can't be more dysfunctional than the family they grew up in. True, like the like dysfunctional, which is but in the really most ro- functional interesting way to possible. say. Right, exactly. I think what confused me, it might be the same for Neil too, but what confused me was that, so she woke up, she looks over to the picture of her and Wally. Wally's got red hair, (laughs) right? She immediately comes out, feeds Bruce Lee, and we cut to a scene and there's a guy there with red hair and a beard and a mustache. And I was like, what? And then he like opened his mouth and I was like, oh, it's Crispin. Oh, it's Roy. Okay. It took, it was like. And if you had done what I did with like the Oracle thing earlier and you blinked or you happened yeah. to look away and you just weren't because there's so much to process, then I could, a lot you, I could, real quick. I could totally see people getting confused. Yeah. Like, no, I complete, I completely understand. Yeah. It's just, it's a fun little family dynamic and I hope they explore it. Also, apparently Roy is going by Will now, which Google told me is apparently Roy Harper's middle name. Uh, so yeah. that makes some sense. It's yeah. going I am going to be doing the same thing Nightwing does though. Like if 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 Will Harper keeps showing up this season, I will inevitably keep calling him Roy and yeah. just keep screwing up. I know. I know. I hear you. You had mentioned too, we were talking about this that uh there's a lot of heavy stuff <laughs> that happens in this uh yeah. this episode, but there's also some counterpoints to that heaviness <laughs> as yes. well with Artemis and Nightwing. Yes, they're genuinely hilarious. Like we're dealing with episodes that are have some dark stuff that they could not have done on Cartoon Network and is genuinely really interesting to see where they are taking that and being able to push those boundaries farther. But then you have like Artemis and Nightwing who just keep quipping the entire time. And I'm like, this lightens it enough that I that it feels like the same show that I'm not like, why are we in a grim, dark world of nonsense? Because it's not. There's, they can show blood and they can show death, but they yep. can also still have Nightwing and Artemis have an ex- the, their whole exchange where they are in the middle of a fight and she just shouts Nightwing and he just goes, I'm working on it. And seconds later, she's <laughs> like, Nightwing? And he just goes, I'm working on it. And it just killed me. So I'm like, yeah, no, that's real. That's true. But some of the notes that Neil added in here too, um, just the entire Halo scene is not Cartoon Network. <laughs> And I was telling people like, well, is it like the original s- series? And I'm like, it really is. Except you can tell scenes where you're like, oh, okay, that Cartoon Network would have ad- asked them to show this from a different angle or imply this as opposed to something else. Like, we wouldn't have seen the king and queen of Markovia 
you know, lying in bed holding each other's hands as they died. Like, that's not what oh. we'd have seen. Oh, right? God, I didn't even. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, no, I've they're holding. each episode three time and I didn't yeah. realize. That. No, they're lying in bed and they have they have like crawled over and held each other's hands as they bled out on the bed. Like, you're not going to see that. Also, I screamed, everybody screamed in our viewing party when um, Plasmus grabs Halo by the face. Yeah. And then it's not just the grabbing her by the face because that's kind of covered up and it's it sucks and it's terrible. What got me was when he pinned her to the ground and she's grabbing his arm and her her hands disintegrate. Yeah. And I was like, oh, God, what is happening? Um yeah, which gets me into Halo. I, I have a lot to say about Halo. We're going to put a little bit in our Crashing the Mode segment here, but I'll get into... I'm not going to say everything I have to say about Halo because I think it might be too many spoilers, but I will uh, we'll hold it for the individual because I want to see what they do because this is obviously a different take on Halo. Yes. So we'll talk about that a little bit, but um, yeah. I'm very excited to see more of her. Bonkers. Bonkers. Um, what they have decided to go with, and they needed that. Like, uh, they needed Tigress saying stuff like, "Oh, now I guess we know why they call him the Count." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was good. That yeah, was real good. stuff like that. Yeah, we needed those levity moments or super, super, uh, or um, Dick saying to Superboy, uh, "Sorry, buddy, this counts." <laughs> 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 yeah, I never wear a super suit. Yeah, and I and I find it hilarious that Superboy's dark wear is just a black t shirt. Right, <laughs> that's the only difference. Like if you right. look at it, it's probably the same t shirt just turned inside out. <laughs> oh God, I love it. It's it's so good. They had a lot of those little things, and like the th- the the opening things for the f- the second two episodes that are these like out of context sort of little cold opens that are like the mm-hmm. beast boy PSA and like the beast boy interview. I really like their cool juxtaposition that does really awesome world building for the show. Yeah. while Also making sure that you're never bogged down by this getting too dark. Like there's the, the more, you know, joke at the yeah. end of mm-hmm. Beast boys PSA right. that had uh-huh. me dying. Yeah. Cause I forget, I'm forgetting what they changed it to, but they like, t- adjusted it just enough that it's mm-hmm. not copyrighted and nope. I and I died. And they also had the the whatever the good world or whatever it is, the yes. GW instead good of the WB. Studios. Right in there, which I think is pretty funny. Um, and on on good, the good world glasses you can apparently watch Hello Megan, which is what I noticed. I first. saw that too, yeah. And G Gordon Godfrey. Somebody's got a weird juxtaposition of of shows they're watching on there. Yeah, too funny. Um well th- some of the other things that just noticed as they picked up in the background um, we didn't see the bio ship, and I had originally put in my notes. I can't remember if we if we see the bio, bio ship in a trailer. And uh, we went back and looked at some old notes, and yes, we we actually do see the bio ship in a trailer. There's something in we're going to put in crashing the moat that Emily blew my mind about. Um, but we're going to leave that there. Um, we'll leave it there. We'll leave <laughs> we'll it get there. Back to that. I love that we get to see Jennifer and Anissa, Jeff's uh, kids. I'm just, I, I see him and I'm like, oh, look, season four, <laughs> right? Or like we're seeing these next generation kids already. And I just, I love it. The Sentinel Park Zeta tube is yeah. super public. What is yeah. that about? Um, interesting. I don't know what does, that means. Is it like a, po- like a police a call box? Enough? I don't know, maybe. But I'm like, is it like a police call box? Like you can, you <laughs> they know it's there, but. I, I'm surprised people aren't just standing around with cameras hoping it opens at some point and people come out. Uh, Tempest uh, being the uh, Atlantean yes. ambassador was awesome, but also Troya. So we finally, yes. for the first time, officially see Donna Troy in Young Justice, which made me so happy. And then some of the other characters, Batwoman, awesome. I don't remember hearing that she was going to be on it. Maybe I missed that. Um, one of the still shots we got earlier uh, before the episode came out, I thought was a new design on Cyborg, but it's not. It's hardware, which makes for another character from the Milestone line that got introduced along with Rocket and Icon. So we're going to get some more Milestone characters uh, in Static Shock for that matter. So I'm excited about that. And Katana was a member of the League before the Outsiders? Um, I'm not an Outsiders expert. I do have We do have someone who's going to come on and talk about the Outsiders with us. But I don't remember Katana being anything before she was an outsider. So that's an interesting twist. To go back to Troya for a second. Yeah. Because I didn't want to interrupt you. But going back to Troya for, a, for for one second. 
one, I love her already from her brief introduction. But two, I lo- I do love that we are finally getting to see her, especially because Greg had confirmed somewhere along the lines when people asked why they jumped straight to Cassie for Wonder Girl. His response was, no, Donna Troy joined the team and left the team in the five-year time skip, and they just couldn't find a way to introduce her in the season that worked. So the fact that we have now gotten to have her introduced, I'm like, oh, that's great. I love that little little bit of world building and showing that Atlantis and Themyscira both have UN ambassadors. I'm like, that's that's fantastic. I, I just still, I, I mentioned this in our first couple of seasons of reviews. I just love that, like, you could take freshman Atlantean, you know, <laughs> at a, yeah. you know, I just love the the incorporation of this thing. It's just, it's just something that exists on this world, you know, yes. it's not some secret somewhere. I love it. We mentioned Halo. Uh, I, Neil specifically was saying he can't wait to hear more uh, voice work from Zara, um, who's doing the voice of Halo. She obviously didn't have many lines in these first few episodes, but I'm sure she will have much more as time goes on. Um, and we have her in the queue for interview soon as well, which I'm really excited about. So we'll be able to hear from her as well. And speaking of other new characters, Neil is also super excited to see more of Steel, who oh, walks yes. in for two seconds He's at the enormous. beginning of this episode. I love, and he's enormous. I, I love it because I don't know because they they show they show him like outside, not in the like in the comics. They'll show him like outside of his armor, and then he puts his yeah. armor on, and he's like the same size. And I'm like, no, Irons is it, he's a huge dude to start with. So you're gonna put him in this this suit like he's gonna be gigantic. I love that design choice and standing next to. Next to Jeff, who's who's like an Olympic level athlete, and he just makes him look like the Atom. It's I, I love it. Um, I, the one thing that was frustrating for me, my um, uh, we often watch things with subtitles on because of some hearing issues we have in the family, and the subtitles are rough. Uh, I don't know if you've watched it with the subtitles on. I haven't. I. I think, you know, we do really want to be positive. Um, you know, the, the show itself is fantastic. So we're going to focus on that. But I have to make a note about this. They need to get someone who knows this material to do these subtitles. Um, Sphere is referred to as Seer. When Black Lightning says, I haven't been able to use my power since Ran, it's Iran, like the country here. But one thing that really got me was early on when Don, when uh, Green Arrow is leaving the the League, Canary turns to him and says, Ollie, but they make it Wally. So she says Wally to him. And I'm just like, there's like a bunch, there's several levels of not okay with that. And there's, it's just all through. And I get that there's, this is weird language and it's making reference to things that's really in the show and that kind of stuff. Um, but they, I, I just, I, ho- I hope they go back and they get some stuff fixed up because um, for people who are watching this, who have hearing impairment, it's just it makes a lot bunch of scenes more confusing um, yeah. and inconsistent, and I think that that's not fair for people who have um, disabilities that are, you know that have either audio processing issues and they need to read things to be able to process it or have hearing issues. So that's my nod. Please, if you guys are listening to this, please um, please take a look at that and see if you can get that cleaned up. Um, I think it's important for your fans. I absolutely agree. I have a couple like that beetle. Neil was also talking about this beetle too. This beetle that was that he was using. Uh, one, it seems super smart. Two, <laughs> Nightwing seems to be talking to it directly, which is kind of yeah. cute, but also makes me super wonder if it's actually Beetle Tech. Like, is that blue? Is that is that Jaime? Did he just split? Does he split off stuff so that the team can use things now? I mean, we saw him create the eggs at the end of season two and other stuff. So I'm just like, hmm, that's interesting. I mean, it's a beetle design. Yeah. I mean, it's a beetle. It is. Specifically. Because like, I hadn't even thought of that, but my mind did when it first showed up. I'm like, why isn't this vaguely bird shaped? Like right. you have a motif. Why do you have why do you have something outside of mm-hmm. your motif? That's what jumped out at me. And I was like, hmm, interesting. And then when he turns to it at one point, he goes, you're supposed to be on my side. I was like, <laughs> okay, so it's not being controlled by Oracle, right? <laughs> so I don't know. I, it's It's interesting. Uh, one thing that came up with me too is like I, another time I screamed is when Jeff hit that rock. Yeah, that I was like rough. Flinched. Rough, and I he's clear. Flinched. He's clearly unconscious, and I know he's like again Olympic level athlete. But how did he get on that beach? That was 
kind of convenient. And I'm part of me is wondering if like, are, is this going to be another Artemis shoots an arrow from off screen moment where we come back and we found out Lagan's been following, like the has been following them the whole time or do you know what I mean? Something's going on. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Maybe that should have been on crashing the mode, but it's not. I'm just like, oh, I mean, it could be. <clears throat> it could be he just washed up on the water, but. I know talking to Neil about it, Neil initially thought it looked like like they'd broken Black Lightning's back. Right. Which I did. I also had that thought. Oh, yeah. But I was like, but it feels like it's too early for something that much to happen to a character. But who know we might get something in a later episode of him having problems with it. I could see that happening. Maybe. I mean, it was not subtle. Like and it, it, it wasn't it was a hard hit. And I'm thinking yeah. like they didn't have him knock his head. Yeah. Like they had something else happen and uh, so I'm not sure I, I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Dr. X. What uh, once E-C-K-S. again KS. Yeah, Dr. X. Um Simon X super another like scrape in the bottom of the barrel pole <laughs> he's even got that same t- mustache that he wears with a costume like you can't tell he's like the errol flynn mustache i don't know it's so funny and but perfect pole um and i thought i saw was that perdita at the coronation I think so because there is there is and they bother to show her more than once, which makes me think that we're supposed to know that and, it's Perdita. And at one point, she's standing right next to, you know, the heir apparent. So I'm just like, this looks a lot like Perdita. And yeah, they have a yeah. lot of blondes in this show. But, <laughs> but and like they clearly drew her as she is. She has her bodyguard standing next to her at one point, And she is much shorter than him. So yeah. I'm assuming we are supposed to interpret that as yeah. teenager. And we do see someone who is definitely Queen Verdita in Garfield's interview, because apparently Garfield Logan is dating Queen Verdita, and it's really heckin' cute. It is cute. And then they met at Wally's funeral. Yeah, that's sure a thing that made Oof. my friends cry when I watched it with, <laughs> with some oh, friends. Yikes. But I think that's suppo- that was supposed to be Queen Verdita, and I think that was supposed to be kind of setting up for us to see her in episode three and kind of be like, oh, that is her. Now that's cool. Right. I liked it. And of course, the, you know, Vertigo was in, you know, yeah. there as well. Yeah. And there was a the whole thing with Vladiva and the whole deal. Because apparently they're neighboring countries. So it would make perfect sense for her to be there. Right. Um, which also brings up Stargirl, actually. Yeah. So Courtney's in this, but she's not the Stargirl super heroine. She's a talk show host that focuses on this sci fi fan show. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with that, but I'm I'm interested. I want to see what's happening with that. Like, does she get the staff? Is Starman out somewhere? I'm 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 intrigued for sure. And I have so many thoughts on Beast Boy as a meta actor and all of that. I love it. It's real good. I really like it. I, I really it. like that they've apparently incorporated his powers into whatever show he's on. I love all of it. <laughs> yeah, makes perfect sense. And actually, I I'm. I'll have to do a little research, but I'm pretty sure that was a pull from the comics as well. <laughs> I'd have to go and uh, and, and look and that up a, again. And it's a bit of a throwback to season two where when he meets Impulse, he goes, when do I get my own TV show? Oh, he does. Oh, yeah. Reality show, yeah. I think he says. Reality show. He right. does say reality show. Right. But That's so I'm funny. Like, it's hilarious that you did eventually get to that point. Yeah. Baron Bedlam, too. I made a reference yeah. and like, I don't know how they would handle this ridiculousness. Uh, I made a reference to that in our Intel update number 12. And we nodded to it again during the free comic book day comic commentary review as well. They did it. They pulled it off. <laughs> I classic Greg Brandon combo. They took something that just is ridiculous and they made it work really well. I tried to, I'm looking at some of the rest of my notes, some of the stuff we already talked about, like Superboy chilling out, Geoforce was great, Superboy just handing the lamb his butt, like it was so good with the fighting style, it was so great. Uh, what, what did Neil have to say? Do we have any more things from Neil? We do. Neil um, we do. Uh, and I, I was actually thoughts. saving this one for the end. Calder's Aquaman now. Calder is Aquaman now. It, it, like in the first few minutes, we get White Martian McGann. We get she's leading the team. We get Calder as Aquaman. Um, this is all stuff Neil brought up. Uh, unbelievable. Like so much stuff uh, left and right. 
and then Batman leaving and why he leaves and starting Batman Incorporated and having this crazy team. And I'm like, wait, when are we going to cut to that team? And this, I mean, clearly he's going to start the outsiders at some point, I would guess, or maybe they're not going to do that because they're going to have Nightwing do it instead. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. You want to keep a team focused, but yeah, clearly the Batman incorporated thing, I think is going to be interesting, especially because it wasn't Batman who said that it's black lightning who says that. Yes. So part of me is like, is this just a nod and an Easter egg or is this like, I think it's, pro- I think it's, I think it's a nod and Easter egg. I don't think Bruce yeah. would call it that. <laughs> but one thing I found was interesting is that, and maybe someone can answer this for me, but like Arrow Wet went. Yes. Because she is Gotham. She is also Gotham, I think. No, she's not. Never mind. No, no I was isn't she Star City? Artemis is, Artemis is Gotham, and I was confusing the fact that Artemis does save her in season one, but they aren't in I think they're in City. Star City with Green yeah. Arrow at that point. Sorry. No, Take that's all okay. that back. <laughs> no, that's okay. But I I was thinking about it. I was like, I don't I don't know Arrow Wet that well from the comics. Just some stuff that I've read. Um, since the show. So I'm wondering like, okay, I mean, he's like, there's like 50 archers. I'm taking one, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know. Or maybe the fact that Ollie and, oh, oh yeah. Ollie and Ollie and Bruce already had this conversation. Dinah, yeah. Dinah accused him of that and he didn't, he didn't deny it. So I arrow it's probably the understudy of Ollie and that's why. Yeah. So, okay. Mm. About the, about that scene, going back to that scene, cause you brought up Dinah and Arrowette and all of that. I I really want to know more about this because one, apparently Tim and Cassie are still together and Tim walked out and that's going to cause some sort of drama and I want to see it. Yeah. I have questions. I also have so many questions and like, I don't know if I'm supposed to have these questions, but I have so many questions about Green Arrow and Black Canary because that conversation implies that they have a close relationship, but the fact that he didn't tell her about this makes me wonder are they together? What level of together are they? What is, we know they were dating in season one. Are they still dating? Are they exes? I don't know. I have questions. Yeah, for sure. And like, I know I'm me. I'm the girl who always has questions about who everyone's dating, but like it would add some layers to this Justice League drama, depending on whose relationships with who are being affected here. Yeah. I think it's, I don't know. I think it's pretty clear that Ali made a terrible choice as usual. Yeah. Also yeah. the fact that they bothered to include that nod to the fact that Tim and Cassie are still together makes me like real curious about how that's going to unfold because we know from the comics and we've mentioned it before in the comics, Tim and spoiler have dated before. Yep. So that's a thing. And spoiler was one of the people who also walked out with Batman. So that's a thing, yeah. and we'll see what happens there. Yeah, yeah. But outside of relationships, I am also very interested in seeing how that team progresses and what we see with them. Completely unrelated to teen romantic drama, I yeah. promise. You know, it's funny. Um, Neil had made a, made a comment, too, that I thought was really funny. Yeah. He said, um, you, you realize, he said, uh, recruiting Superboy was just to get Sphere, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, 100%. He's like, guys, Superboy, uh, also, can you bring your bike? Because um, that you be bring rad. your bike that got an upgrade between seasons? Yeah, totally. It looks so cool. It, it's fear looks so cool. It's super great. Um, and speaking of Superboy, Neil also pointed out that he loves the nod to to Connor connecting uh, Bedlam with Cadmus even after seven years and showing that he still has that in his head and all yeah. of that, and the fact that he has that moment with the mother box and like has this genuinely really heartbroken expression that Neil was pointing out and I noticed too and like like boy boy cares and it's a lot and I love it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, another thing that Neil pointed out which is always a thing for these for Young Justice is just the villains, right? So Baron Bedlam uh he when I first watched it I see I saw him grab that that tape before he ran out and left. And I was like, okay, I guess that's data. I guess it's like how to make the tar or something. Maybe I'm not quite sure. Uh, and then it was on the second viewing that I figured out what I think Neil figured out the first time, which was, Oh no, he took the surveillance footage of Brion getting his, getting that treatment and edited it and was using it. 
And that ties into something else that I think was great was that I feel like even Brion's brother was working at full capacity there. Like yeah. he was like, yeah, I'm not an idiot and I've <laughs> known you my whole life. So I'm pretty yeah. sure you're under arrest. But also, Brion, what are you doing? I can't. You got to leave, you know, like and in the comic, in yeah. the comic, the original comic, he was exiled. And I think they actually handled that really well without making it seem too strange or that it couldn't be reconciled between he and his brother over time, um, which I also really liked. I like the fact that he and his brother seemed to be on good terms and they disagreed on a few things. But, you know, in the end, it was great. And I thought Crispin did a great voice as his brother as well. That was tough. I don't know what I, I'm assuming they made it a language for that. But man, that's I, gonna be tough. I first time and second time through, I think, too, blinked and missed him taking the disc that had the footage on it. And I just I just accepted that he had it. But then like on my third watch, so I'm like, oh, he actually he they actually bother to include him taking that security footage. Yeah. And along those along those same lines connected to the villains and all of that, there is a line count Vertigo has when he first realizes that it's Superboy when he takes off the mask and he's like, oh, the Superboy. He includes the line. I think the UN would be very interested to hear about what you're doing here or something like that. Right. He mentions the UN in there and I'm like, does the UN know about the team now? Is that a thing? Is Superboy common knowledge? What? Oh, where are we? Oh, yeah, that's right. Because the, right? the team has always been covert. Yeah. So I don't but know. is Superboy covert? Maybe we'll see. Because like Tempest and, Tempest and Donna Troy are both on the in the UN, yeah, but and they, they were both, both part of the team. They, I don't know well, they were both part of the team, but were, I'm yes, were pretty sure that they were leaguers. Actually, they didn't make any reference to them being leaguers. They simply said yeah. they simply said the league is led by an Atlantean and a Themyscarin. Yes, so maybe Wonder they, Woman is co-chair of the league. We didn't mention that earlier, but she is. And yeah, that's she's really co-chair cool. with Calder. Yeah, yeah. Well, clearly they have a lot of missions going on in different places, so it's probably pretty important. <laughs> there's so many league members too now. Oh, there's th we're gonna have so much to talk about when we break each of these episodes down individually. But yeah, these are just thoughts. Yeah, and um, some of the last thoughts from Neil here. One, Sphere takes some punishment. <laughs> oh yeah, poor Sphere. <laughs> but also, girl is awesome. And the moment I don't, I don't know if it's because Neil and I are both dads but like the moment black lightning gets his powers back was was like him losing his powers and why and getting them back all tracked for me the one thing that i found was interesting and I, I think this is i think this is a result of maybe some communication differences about the release schedule i did feel like there was a lot of reminding us about black lightning's power loss and why it happened and I, I think that's because Greg and Brandon wrote these episodes to be aired probably weekly, I would imagine, and couldn't have possibly known they were going to do this three episode binge one night thing because it's never been done before. Um, yeah. So uh, though I think that that was like, oh, okay, we're being reminded again. Like we literally just watched it. Um, but I don't think that's a discredit, I think, to, to Greg yeah. and Brandon. I think that's actually just the way you write shows and then this release schedule was strange. So I personally didn't mind it that much in some cases because like I know I had mentioned during season two that because season two was released weekly, but we were watching it kind of binge watching it to review it. There were moments where I was like, ah, someone is saying the same facts for the 10th time with this. I kind of liked how they framed it as him sort of having like these PTSD flashbacks yeah, that's that fair. allowed that. That instead of just having somebody over and over again, having him be like, I still don't have my powers, having it be connected to that emotional bit yeah. made it less exposition-y to me because it felt like this is both reminding us of a thing if you are watching these week to week, but it is also giving you that emotional moment with the character. I totally agree. Handling it, handling it different, it, handling information that you're handing out to your readers or your watchers yes. or whatever, and handing it out and reminding people in different ways or from different perspectives or different people is a great way to handle trying to get that information and remind somebody without having to feel like you're, you know, it, it's that, it's that real hard line between spoon feeding your readers or watchers and get, and trusting them. Cause you yeah. want to be able you want to make sure they have the information, but you also 
you know, I don't know. You don't want to overdo it either. It's it's a tough line to walk, and I think they do a great job in Young Justice in general. I was just something I noticed. I think particularly on the second viewing through, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a lot. But I think if it had been a week, I would have liked this. This would have been perfect, you know? And I also, speaking of the three episodes a week thing that they're doing, I felt like it really worked, and we'll see how it works going forward. But with these first three episodes, because they are covering, like, the setup middle and end of one mission it felt very cohesive to I release agree. them all together yeah so we'll see how that works going forward and if that is always true which hopefully it will be and i have confidence that it probably will be but yeah. like th- these ones watching them back to back i was like oh we are still ending on enough of a cliffhanger that i am excited for next week yeah with artemis being like where do we go now and me being like i don't know but i want to find out for sure while still allowing that kind of cohesive conclusion and that binge watch feel that we really like with this show. Absolutely. I wanted to actually think one more thing that I just noticed that Neil uh, mentioned, and we'll end this on this again, going back to the tie-in comic, this GW studios that they keep referencing to that got pretty focused on highlighted in this uh, tie-in comic. And so I want more, I want more of it. Uh, Yeah. So I said it earlier, I'll say it again. Please go support that. We'll actually do a yes. comic commentary uh, as soon as we can on that tie-in comic as well um, so we can talk about some of that. Um, and Emily can, sh- I've got thoughts Emily can on shriek, that tie-in. shriek some more. I have thoughts too, which I think are fantastic. I'm intrigued by some things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, all right. So that's enough of our uh, astering all over these three episodes. Believe it or not, we are saving some things for the individual breakdown episodes. Um, <laughs> for well. those of you who may not have heard uh, what's going to happen, um, we're going to do these type these uh, uh, scream something episodes uh, every week following the episodes that were released on the previous Friday um, through January. And then we're going to start going through the individual episodes with all 13 episodes in retrospect. So I suspect by the time we get to episode 13, we will have some really interesting things to say about episode one. I'm guessing. <laughs> um, yes. I'm just, that's definitely going to happen. Um, yeah. Knowing this show. Yes. Right, exactly. So every week from here until the end of January or the first week in February, really, you're going to be hearing us doing this. Uh, and then we'll get to our individual episodes. Then there's going to be, what, a five month hiatus. And then the next 13 episodes will air in June. And in between um, January and June, we will be uh, releasing our individual weekly reviews of every episode. But we also have, as I mentioned, we have interview uh, an interview scheduled hopefully soon um, with Zara, who does the voice of Halo. Um, the, the composers of the music, the way that they did the intro and outro music for this season is incredibly <sighs> subtle. Unbelievable. I cried the first time I heard it. <laughs> yeah. Neil and I are, are heading to uh, Studio City. We should be interviewing them within, the, within this month as well. And we have some other surprises as well, um, plus more discussions, uh, discussion guests, and secret origins and more. Um, but Got to get that Cheshroy Super Sweethearts done. <laughs> yeah. Please. Uh, so with all of that, we're going to head to Crashing the Moan, and then we're going to do a little fan service and wrap up. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through uh, Rich and Emily's head based on the episodes released uh, at the time of this recording. So this Crashing the Mode is based on episodes one through three, obviously. We're not going to go into too much detail here on some things, but I did mention Halo. Here's the big thing about Halo. She's not a metahuman. She's an alien. So This is news to me. Hi, Rich hasn't told me this yet either. So do you remember the scene where she's hugging Sphere? Yes. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Where where Artemis is like, well, I'm glad you guys are getting along. She also currently has amnesia. Yes, she does, because she ended up being sucked into, I don't know if this is going to be the origin, I have no idea, but she ended up going into an actually deceased body. And so a lot of the memories from Halo's, Halo, the girl, the girl that became Halo, had decayed by the time she got into the body, so she barely remembers who she is. And she does make a mention of something like, I remember English. I remember English is a thing. But I don't know if that's from the alien or if that's from her. So there's a lot more to talk about, but um, that's the big thing. 
which, you know, is all just possible. It, they could change things. They could change things. don't know for things. sure. They could change things. That's true. Like, disclaimer upon disclaimer. Well, don't I'll, take I'll anything also, we say I'll also tell facts. you they've already changed her powers. Yes, so the the colors used to be associated with things that don't look like they're the same. Obviously, she went into a body of someone who was not a psychopath, which was the original Halo. She had been a psych. <laughs> the original Halo was like a psychopathic murderer, and then she and then she died, and then this alien got into her. So they've changed. They have changed a lot. Right? So this crashing the mode thing is just some stuff that runs through my head. Going, oh, is that where they're going? So I'm glad you. I could blow your mind because. Emily's now going to say what she told me before we started recording and blew my mind. So please go ahead. <laughs> before I say that, I will say I forgot to write this down. But if we're talking potential storylines, I am like fingers crossed for a wedding this season. But we have no idea what's going to happen there. And I'm just like, I just want to put good energy out into the universe and hope good things happen. <laughs> oh, my God. If there's a McGann Connor can- wedding, I, I we're going to have to have a defibrillator in your like if living space. If we get to see it. I will cry, guys. I will cry so much. <laughs> Especially because, like, when we do breakdowns, we can talk about this. But the fact that they included the proposal in the first episode means that this is a specific storyline that is not, it is different from if where you put a proposal in a storyline changes what storyline you are telling. Whoa. Okay. That wasn't what you said earlier that blew my mind, but that's blowing my no. mind. It's, okay. No, I'm, I'm, I, you said that and I was like, Oh, of course. But why didn't I actually realize that? <laughs> That's yes, of course. Mini super sweethearts, but like, yeah, it's a basic thing because it depends on how you are treating it within your narrative as like what I don't want to say level of importance because it is always important. Sure, yeah. But it depends on whether you are setting up like a storyline of this is a story that leads to a proposal or this is a story that results from a proposal. And by setting it in the first episode, we are setting this up as whatever storyline happens with them this season is on some level the story that results from a proposal rather than like... Okay. This was a... Uh, uh, Crashing the Mode also has a mini Super Sweethearts and mini uh, Canary Debrief apparently this month. <laughs> I'm going to have to... I'm, I'm going to re- have to at some point do like... No, let's revisit this in a Canary Debrief like, yeah. for sure. Um, some so At some point, depending on what happens this season, we'll talk about it. Yeah, let's do that. Wow, that's great. It's been okay. a- Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Now talk about the other thing. <laughs> the other thing. The non-romance thing. So me and Rich and a lot of people on the internet the past few days have been talking about what is up with these credits. Because the credits this season, because they don't have to worry about like credits being shrunk down tiny in the corner as we switch to the next thing on Cartoon Network, they've done a thing with them. That they're these still images with the minor key version of the theme song playing over the credits. And the first episode one made everyone cry because it is Artemis and Wally's dog, Bruce Lee, cuddling a plushie of Kid Flash. And we all sobbed. I literally like burst. When I say I burst into tears, like there were tears coming down my face before I realized what was happening. I I, whined at a pitch that I'm pretty sure only (laughs) dogs can hear. I think I was like, I'm so hyped for this episode. And they cut to that. and I'm like, oh, no. Yeah, I was like, oh, God, what guys? (laughs) <laughs> a little warning. So that happened, and we all oh. cried. And then episode two, we saw the super cycle. Yeah. And I was like, just that's this, interesting. It was just that's a still different. shot of the super cycle. It's just a s- still, still shot of Sphere chilling in the woods. I was prepared and this time. I was like, you yeah. can't get me off so guard this you, time. What are you going to do? What? <laughs> how are you going to hurt us? Right. Um, and so like, <laughs> and then the third one is just a truck. It's a truck outside and a so, house. And I'm like truck outside a house. And so we had been talking for a while. And like after the first two, part of my mind was like, are they just are they showing us like the team pets? Are they doing I was absolutely convinced. I'm like, they're doing something. And we're going to know by the end of the season, we're going to (laughs) go back and we're going to rewatch all this. And my nose is going to bleed. And like, I'm going to (laughs) have seizure. I'm going to see through time. It'll be awesome. But we were talking about this casually. Before the recording, and I threw something out as a joke, and Rich Emily had broke. said Emily said um, the first first thing she thought of after the first two episodes was that they're just showing like the, the team pets. the team like pets like, or something like that like the juxtaposition of like Bruce Lee and like Sphere yeah. and like maybe they'll show Wolf at some point and it's right. just like these these things we care about they're Ace, wonderful. Ace the, the Bat Hound will show up. <laughs> 
please make him canon. That'd be great. Um, but episode three is this truck. I'm like, but then it's a truck. I'm like, what's, what is going on with and this? And I threw out the idea that what if that's the bio ship? Because I'm pretty sure. Because that's, based the, on that's the truck outside of McCann and Superboy Connor's house. Miss Martian's house. And I threw it out there as a joke, and then Rich broke. So because I, I was, I was like, I, I had said like, like I said earlier in the show, I said there's no bio ship. And originally, I put in my notes. I can't remember if I, we saw a bio ship in the trailer, but I got really sad thinking that maybe the bio ship had passed away because you know, in the last season, two years ago in Showtime, McGann had said, you know. You know, you can do it, old girl, that kind of stuff. And I got kind of sad there. Then we went through our notes and found out that, oh, no, she, the bio ship's in the trailer somewhere. That's when the connection came up that maybe the bio ship has turned itself into a truck. Maybe. So it like, could park. It can definitely shift. Like, it has some level of shape-shifting abilities. Yeah. I mean. So maybe. Maybe it's evolved. Because it's a red truck. It's a red it's truck. It's a red and that's black what, truck. That's when my jaw dropped. When you said that, I was like, oh, oh. Because then I remembered the color scheme and I was like, I think, I think it's the truck. <laughs> so if that's true, I will, I will be very happy. And I just think it's hilarious that that might be true. This is what happens when me and Rich ca talk casually about Young Justice and like, <laughs> come up with wild theories. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll so see. I'm buying into we'll that's see. my head we'll cannon for the moment. We'll find out in nine more episodes, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. We'll watch. We'll, and, we'll start episode. We'll start episode four, and like the credits will happen, and it'll just be like, "Here's a picture of like a toaster," and we're like, "Oh, now nothing makes sense." Right. <laughs> I don't think they'll do that. I don't either. Like, <laughs> Oh, too funny. Anyway, there are a lot of other things we could mention crashing the mode, but we're choosing not to. These were the two we decided that we were going to we were going to talk or three, apparently. Um <laughs> sorry. That, I didn't write that one down. It's just been on my mind for the past four No, days. it makes perfect sense. So yeah, for those of you who wanted to listen to that, I hope that makes the rest of the storylines interesting as things unfold and we find out if these things are true or not, or how they handle it uh, in this case. And uh, <laughs> that's enough of that. Let's get to some fan service. And if you see something, scream something. Thank you, Beast Boy. Emily, you have some fan service for us? I do. I do. Uh, this week for our first fan service in a while, because we haven't done fan service since end of season two. That's right. We have a, another video from fan favorite here on here on whelmed gtg random friend of the show color friend of the show friend of the show friend of the show gtg random sorry i forgot i forgot for a moment what we said we're big fans uh, yes we are we love we love her stuff and we have a video from her called young justice returns that was made it's this beautiful retrospective of the first two seasons that she made right after the season three announcement uh, and before we had any footage or any trailers for season three. Uh, but now that we finally have a season three, it seemed like the perfect time to share this wonderful little video because Young Justice has returned. It's officially here and it's time to celebrate. Absolutely. We, I love it. I just watch it to cry. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's crying it's for me is so hard. It. It's juxtaposing all of the beautiful moments in season one it's and so season good. two and like the character arcs and it's so good. As a matter of fact, just watching that as like a remembrance of what everything is before you watch <laughs> the th – it's so good. Anyway, oh, so good. thank you for that. And Definitely I can't go check wait out. to see what she ends up doing with stuff from season three. <laughs> oh, yes. Definitely yes. subscribe to that channel. Uh, and with that, uh, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Uh, thank you for spending time with us, everyone. Here we are again. If you'd like yes. to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend, sharing it on social media, however you want to share it with people. 
and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Uh, The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those just because of the way the internet works. (laughs) So weird. Um, We want to know what you're saying. We do, and sometimes we don't get to see it. And if you want to help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.